let's talk a little bit about the ablation procedure itself. We start an IV, put wires into that IV, and thread them up into the heart. We heat the tissue of the heart through the end of those wires, which creates scar tissue. Scar tissue doesn't conduct electricity, and we're altering how electricity flows through the heart. Some people with atrial fibrillation uh, really only have a problem with episodes starting. It's not that once they're in fib, it'll last forever. Their episodes will stop on their own after five minutes or a couple of hours. Other people are in it all the time, and unless you have an electrical cardioversion to get out of it. So for the people where the problem is simply that episodes are starting, isolating the pulmonary vein seems to be enough. For people who have longer duration episodes of fib that require electrical cardioversion, we need to do something more. We need to alter the chamber's ability to sustain fibrillation because once it starts, it'll just keep going and going. At that point, isolating the veins is insufficient. We have to do it, but we need to do something else. That something else is to create lines of scar tissue um, between the pulmonary veins, from the right side of veins to the left side of veins, and from the left side of veins to the valve in the heart. And those extra lines alters how the atrium can handle waves and can prevent episodes from perpetuating. The overall success rate for treatment of atrial fibrillation or for ablation of atrial fibrillation depends in part upon how, how much trouble there is with the electricity in your heart. If we just have to isolate the veins, the success rates are a little higher than if we have to isolate the veins and we have to create lines of scar tissue. Uh, but the success rates are roughly 75% or so for everybody. Unfortunately, the single procedure success rate is typically only about 50% meaning it's not uncommon to require more than one ablation procedure to be fixed. The reason for that um, is what we're trying to do is create scar tissue that won't conduct electricity with our ablation, but we can't always successfully achieve that. Sometimes we destroy the cells, they heal the scar tissue, and they won't conduct ever again, but other times we've just damaged the cells. They don't conduct while we're in the ablation lab watching, but they'll heal up and start to conduct later. It's as if the ablation is creating a fence and uh, recurrence is due to a hole in that fence. So a repeat ablation procedure can be thought of as searching the fence line, finding where the holes are, and fixing those holes. Let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of having an ablation. First of all, your doctor is likely to want you to have a CAT scan ahead of time, which gives them sort of a 3D roadmap, lay of the land for their procedure. They're gonna want you to get what's called a transesophageal echocardiogram. It's an echocardiogram of the heart, but from a tube down your esophagus, so that we can make sure that there's no blood clots in the heart before we put catheters in the heart. Typically, you'd come into the hospital on the day of the procedure. The procedure is done under general anesthesia. It lasts about three hours, although the duration can vary widely. Um, after the procedure, you'll go to the recovery room where you'll be for about an hour and a half to two hours and then stay in the hospital overnight. Typically, you'll be discharged from the hospital around noon the day after the procedure. When the procedure is done, you're going to have holes in the veins where we put the catheters in and there's no stitches covering those holes and you're on blood thinners. That's a combination that puts you at increased risk for bleeding. So your job for the first 14 days after the procedure is to do what you can to avoid bleeding. And what you can do is not lift anything heavier than 10 pounds and not do a lot of bending at the waist. The ablation procedure can cause inflammation of the heart. And you care about that for two reasons. One is that inflammation can be painful. You can feel it when you take a deep breath. It's not so painful that it requires um, painkillers, but uh, it can require anti-inflammatory medication. The other reason you care about it is, um, ironically, that inflammation changes the electrical properties of the heart so that it's more likely to have fibrillation. For the first six weeks after the procedure, until the inflammation heals, it's not uncommon to have atrial fibrillation, which does not have a prognostic implication. So if you have atrial fibrillation during the first six weeks, we're going to want to hear about it. We'd want to treat it if we needed to but it doesn't mean the procedure didn't work and you have to go back to the ablation lab. We really start watching for atrial fibrillation from a prognostic perspective after the first six weeks.
a lot of people will ask, how will I know if I need another procedure? The answer is, you don't know at the end of your ablation. There's no test we can do that tells us whether it worked or didn't work. The only way we'll know is if you have more atrial fibrillation after that first six weeks, then it didn't work. So we would know that you needed to go back for another ablation if after six weeks you had a recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Not everybody who has recurrence has to have another ablation. Some people decide they don't want another one. Other people have atrial fibrillation after their ablation, but it no longer bothers them, so they don't need to go and have another ablation. The likelihood of having a recurrence of atrial fibrillation uh, persists forever. There's never a time that you know for sure you're not gonna have AFib tomorrow. But the probability of having AFib drops off dramatically with time. So on the day of the procedure, you have about a 50% chance that you'll have more fib. By six months, if you haven't had fib, you only have about a 6% chance. At a year, a 5% chance, and so on. So there's a very small percentage of people that'll have recurrence after five or 10 years. Um, but most of the people who are gonna have more atrial fibrillation, require another ablation, will know that within the first six months. When we do the ablation procedure, we're actually damaging the lining of the inside of the heart. And as a result, we're putting you at an increased risk of blood clot formation until that damage heals. So whether or not you needed blood thinners in the long term, you're gonna to need to be on blood thinners for the first three months after the procedure. There's a few possible outcomes of an ablation procedure. My personal favorite is you're cured. Uh, but it's also possible that you're not fixed due to the procedure, but now antiarrhythmic medications, which weren't working before, are working. So ablation plus an antiarrhythmic drug is enough to keep you in normal rhythm. Also, some people who are very symptomatic with their atrial fibrillation before the ablation actually have fib afterwards, but are completely asymptomatic. It's not uncommon for people to come into the office and say, Doc, I feel fantastic. It turns out they're actually in atrial fibrillation. But we're doing this to make you feel better. And if you feel better, we don't really need to do more. It's uncommon, but it's actually possible for your atrial fibrillation to feel worse after an ablation than before the ablation. Typically what that means is that you've developed a rhythm called atrial tachycardia, which is a more organized rhythm than atrial fibrillation. It's actually a little bit better electrically, but the heart can actually go faster in atrial tachycardia than it does in atrial fibrillation, and so it can feel worse. The good news about atrial tachycardia is it's fairly easy to ablate. It's, uh, the success rates are higher than ablation for atrial fibrillation. The bad news is that antiarrhythmic drugs which work badly for AFib work even worse for atrial tachycardia. So typically, if you're having atrial tachycardia after an AF ablation, it really means you're probably gonna have to go back and have one more ablation. So let's recap. There is a procedure for fixing atrial fibrillation called the catheter ablation. It works in about 75% of people, but frequently can require more than one procedure. The single procedure success rate is only 50%. When you have an ablation, you're gonna to need to take blood thinners for at least three months afterwards. You're not gonna know after your ablation whether it worked or not. The only way to know is if you have a recurrence of atrial fibrillation, more than six weeks after the procedure, your fib isn't cured. The ablation procedure causes inflammation of the heart, so it's not uncommon to have atrial fibrillation during the first six weeks after the procedure until that inflammation heals. Having atrial fibrillation in the first six weeks does not mean that you haven't been fixed and does not mean that you necessarily are going to need another ablation. So if you have symptomatic atrial fibrillation, particularly if you've tried antiarrhythmic medications without success, you might want to talk to your doctor about an ablation procedure.